you. And as I, under, as I understand it, um, I'll ask a few questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. And then let's let uh, the council members who are here uh, have any questions they want as well. Right. In fact, I, I thought I'd mention, first of all, I see at least two council members, um, Seth Grimes and Kay Daniels Cohen, are both here in the audience. And so, you know, uh, this uh, uh, resolution will be going to them. And we'll be hearing a little later in the evening um, more specifically about the resolution um, from uh, Thomas Nephew. But I thought uh, that, I guess, as you were speaking, first of all, I was incredibly depressed by um, a lot of what you had to say. But uh, I wanted to, um, it made me think about other resolutions that Tacoma Park has taken over the years. And I, I know that this is um, an issue that has come up in council in Tacoma Park, which is, you know, Tacoma Park is famously a nuclear free zone. Um, Tacoma Park took um, uh, stances against the Iraq War. Um, they uh, took a resolution for the impeachment of President Bush. And, you know, these are resolutions that I think the majority of Tacoma Park residents, I imagine, um, stood behind, um, feel good about, and yet the results, um, as we know, uh, George Bush finished out you know, his presidency. Um, the Iraq War was not stopped by this resolution. So um, I, I'm kind of I'm wondering, first of all, um, if you could both address more specifically you know, the role that Tacoma Park can play by passing this resolution um, and, and what it would do to move the debate forward. And also, maybe even dealing with um, an issue that might make some people uncomfortable, which is that Tacoma Park has a reputation um, around Montgomery County, Maryland, and uh, the nation sometimes to um, be held up as a little bit of um, maybe not to be taken seriously. And since this is an issue that, you know, ought to be taken seriously, is there a way that the Stone Park then can position itself and say, you know, we're taking a stance on this because uh, um, it's an important issue, um, not because this is the latest, um, I don't know, fad or, you know, flavor going around. Sure. Um, so maybe in reverse order. It, this is very much uh, a dissimilar situation to, say, for instance, a nuclear free zone. It's, it's similar in the sense that uh, you, know, you have the opportunity to raise your voice about a matter of public concern. It's dissimilar in the sense that you wouldn't be alone, right? It wouldn't be a fringe sensibility. Remember the first resolution that came against this bill was from the Air Force Academy, right? You have plenty of cover. This, this is not a situation where your city would be taking an isolated stance. In fact, you know, that among the first, I think it was the first six state resolutions that were introduced, they were all by Republicans. And quite frankly, progressives and liberals have been very slow to adopt this struggle at the elected layer. At the grassroots, that hasn't been true. I mean, dozens of Occupy sites mobilized on Bill of Rights Day, December 15th. They did it again in early January, again in late January, and in early uh, February. There haven't been national days of action since then, but there is an action coming up on June 24th here in D.C. that I want everybody to uh, take a flyer for. Um, that, of course, reflects my pessimistic assessment that we won't have repealed the law by then. Um, but the, and, and, and the idea here really is, uh, is the city willing to at least march with others, right? This isn't, this isn't a situation where, uh, you know, you're called on or anyone's asking you to uh, back a position that is in, in any way incendiary or kooky or, you know, what have you. If, if anything, you, know, you, you have plenty of cover and the question is, will progressives be represented within the field of voices that are and, and I guess how then how can the city be make sure that this action is a more effective action? I mean, sure. what, so okay, pass the resolution is passed by the city council, and you know, our you know, Tacoma Park goes up on the board, you know, as a, a post. But then, what what happens next to make sure that you know passing this then becomes a more effective action? You know, some of the things you can do include this, and I'd say this particularly to the council members who might be inclined to vote for this resolution is write about it. Uh, and it, I, I'll tell you a quick story about what resolutions have done in past debates. I think you cited one of the ones you cited was the resolution that just now passed against the Patriot Act when it was first passed uh, many years ago, not that long ago. Ten years ago the act was passed. I can't recall when the resolution happened. Uh, and if I go around the country and I ask students in particular, or for that matter, you know, older folks, who's heard about 
FISA, for instance. Who's heard about FISA? Raise your hand if FISA means anything to you. All right, so you're an educated crowd. I guess it's to come apart. That makes sense. And few people have heard about FISA. Few people have heard about COINTELPRO. Everyone has heard about the Patriot Act. And why do you think that is? Because communities all over the country were debating it. It became a subject of conversation in classrooms, at the dinner table. Right? You have the opportunity to do that with the NDAA. Because most people, quite frankly, at the moment, don't, haven't even heard of it. It was signed into law on New Year's Eve. How many people are paying attention to politics on New Year's Eve? Or reading the paper on January 1st? Yeah, well, you guys are <laughs> extraordinary, right? That's why you're part of the Montgomery County Civil Rights Coalition, which I think everyone else here should plug into actively engage with. Um, because these issues are fluid and they are dynamic. And every time you think you've dealt with one issue, the establishment throws up another. And that's the NDAA is a good example of this. Right? I mean, many of us were really focused on a whole range of abuses in the war on terror, and then one just fell out of the sky that makes, quite frankly, that the NDAA makes the Patriot Act look like a joke. Because all the Patriot Act says is that the government can essentially peer into your life and, and invade your privacy at will. But the NDAA means it can lock you up at will without a trial indefinitely. It is in a degree of magnitude worse. In terms of, I would just frame a resolution by cities like Tacoma Park as necessary to create a national movement. Alone, they are insufficient, which is to say there is only so much that this town can do to create the national grass fire. But it's crucial to be a part of it. And it is a matter of critical mass. And I think the cover that you're getting from the libertarian right uh, indicates, again, one opportunity to extend that voice beyond the narrow confines of these, of these towns. Do you see the Obama administration being a uh, kind of a, a vote blocker uh, in terms of organizing in that, you know, how many people in this room, and I, I assume not everybody, but many people in Tacoma Park voted for Barack Obama, so you know, he's our president, right? And so this resolution, this uh, version of this resolution is coming down in his administration. And um, so, you know, it's, it, was, it was easier to march and organize against George W. Bush, but you know, what do Democrats do when the Democratic president is uh, putting out with, uh, you know, it's behind legislation like this. The way I always frame this is what does the dog do after it catches the bus? Um, but, um, I mean, there's, there's two answers to that. And the first is, this was fought out inside the White House. And the interesting thing, again, is the national security professionals, um, of whom there's a pretty high-ranking one who, as you know, is our neighbor, wanted to veto this bill. The political people did not want to be it. Look, well, we won. Now, what do the political people care about? They care about votes, they care about money, they care about publicity. So what are the tools that somebody like my organization that does advocacy at the national level takes from something like this? Um, so in my dream world, Tacoma Park passes the resolution, and it gets written up. And we have a sheaf, back in the old days, if this was an actual sheaf of paper, it would be like that, of op-eds, editorials, and coverage from around the country, from red states and blue states, from conservative jurisdictions and progressive jurisdictions on this. And we start spamming relentlessly the Hill, the White House, and the media saying, look at the insane range of local localities that have spoken out against this and how much the media has jumped on it and what a story it is. And we know from experiences like passing arms control treaties over the objections of Republicans, and that's one again where the political people in the White House didn't want to fight, but the breadth of local media attention, really because that's what brings people out to vote actually, is the local issues, not sort of airy fairy national ones that I like. So, that they care about a lot. Now, my second fantasy is that we'd work with Shahid and we'd put a Tacoma Park City Council member together with a county councilor from um, El Paso County, Colorado. And <coughs> we'd take those two folks and the retired two-star general who works with me and we'd go visit some congressional offices. Um, boy, would we have fun doing that. <laughs> Um, so there is all kinds of potential for creative advocacy at the national level using as a building block the evidence that people at the local level all across the country of varying ideological stripes cared enough to come out on a Thursday night and talk about and eventually vote about this issue. 
Thanks. I, I have one, maybe two more questions. <coughs> uh, one that I think you raised, actually, you're talking about how you know politicians are, are fearful of uh, looking weak, especially Democrats looking weak, uh, when it comes to national security. And, but you also raised the money question. And one thing that has happened in the last decade is that you know we now have not just a military industrial complex, but a security industrial complex. And the largest um, and the newest and, and fastest growing um, major in, in colleges is around uh, homeland security. And if you just look here at University of Maryland, I mean, you know, tremendous numbers of, of students are looking for employment once they get through with their degree in Homeland Security. And I'm wondering, you know, as we're figuring, you know, we're talking about uh, organizing politically, um, you know, there are uh, financial stakes involved as well, and is there a strategy for, you know, addressing that? So, right, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's a security industrial complex. President Eisenhower warned us about this, right? Uh, I guess it was 50 years ago? Uh, which makes it interesting that the military is against this, right? Because you know, this is, this was a little bit different than surveillance, and, and it's it's one of the things about the NDAA that I quite frankly find mystifying. You know, at least with FISA, you could say the telecom companies were poised to make a bundle, and they are making a bundle by reading your email and monitoring your phone calls every day. Has everyone seen the front cover of Wired magazine this month? Read the story if you haven't. The NSA is constructing a data center in Utah that will be the most powerful computing facility ever envisioned by humankind. It takes stadium-sized air conditioners to keep the servers cool. It honestly, it boggles the mind what is happening. But at least there it makes sense because there's a buck to be made. Detention can be a profitable industry. You can look at Geo Corporation or Correction Corporation of America. But you know, I, I don't see it being the kind of cash cow that surveillance is. FEMA's already built detention camps that can house 100,000 Americans within 72 hours notice. Right, so there's there's plenty of slack space. Yeah, I know if you haven't heard that yet, worry. And, and yeah, that, maybe that's where people go if the NDA gets triggered. Um, no, because they're not military. That's what's so lunatic about it. The whole thing is lunatic. I mean, it, honestly, it is, it is bizarre. Uh, and and I just go back again to the, you know last year was the year of the Arab Spring. It was the year that we killed Bin Laden. How are we doubling down on the Patriot Act? And, and making it worse by extending surveillance into detention domestically, right? And remember who gets charged with terrorism. We're talking about charities that fund nonviolence abroad. We're talking about, you know, supposed eco-terrorists. There, there's a representative, um, this is a fascinating phone call, a representative in Missouri, Paul Kurtman, Marine veteran. He's on the phone with Dan Gordon, who's a state legislature in Rhode Island, another Marine Corps veteran. They both have introduced resolutions to repeal the NDAA in their respective state legislatures because they read the DHS report that classified service members returning home from armed service in Iraq or Afghanistan as potential recruits for terrorists. Because of their military skills, they'd be attractive recruits. Many of them might be sympathetic to uh, sort of militia sensibility. If you go to Ron Paul rallies, you'll hear a lot about this because Supporters of Ron Paul were characterized by DHS and a threat report as potential recruits for militias. Right, so I, if any, I, there was the only thing I'd say I'd push back on your pieces is that I think that militias might be subject, in the, and white supremacists may very well be rubbing shoulders with the eco-terrorists and the Muslims and the trade unionists and the communists, and the, right? I mean, and, and, and I think it's important for people who've been part of communities that have been disfavored in other countries to remember that the abuses of any discrete community's interests inevitably expand to impact others. That is the nature of government abuse. It is inherent. That's why we have checks and balances. That's why we have or had constitutional rights. And, um, you know, I'm just ranting now. But I really <laughs> like to hear your questions, particularly from the electeds among you, to, to the extent you have questions, you know, we'd be really interested in entertaining those and obviously others in the audience too. So let me say one really quick thing on that, um, because it goes to the fundamental sort of why is this a problem. That actually, in terms of money, this is a sideshow, but the need to be this afraid and the idea that the threat we face is so profound that the FBI can't handle it, the Justice Department can't handle it, the police can't handle it, a supermax prison can't handle it, the prison industry can't handle it, that's the foundation that lets everything else happen. That's the foundation that lets it be okay to suspend the Constitution. That's the foundation that lets it be okay to start new wars. That's the foundation, and on and on and on and on. So, so actually, in a funny way, 
if we don't have this, then a lot of the pressure for the massive security industrial complex starts to go away.